I think you need somebody who's kind of an AI champion within every function. Otherwise, we're going to end up with a bunch of like half-built products and Gen AI things that have to be maintained. All right, welcome back to our next edition of kind of executive conversations with chief innovators. Today, I'm lucky to have Scott Snyder, chief digital officer at Eversana, also accomplished professor, author, um, thinker on this very topic. And Scott, you know, I, I know there's a lot of things um, that are coming across your radar here. I think it would be great to maybe just step back and start with just kind of introduce yourself and your background and um, you know how, how, how you got, got to where you are today. Yeah, thanks, Pat. It's a very um, zigzag kind of path, but it kind of makes sense when you look look backwards, but it didn't always make sense going forward. So uh started in the big company with Lockheed and GE, and um, that was awesome because you got to see how to build really big, complex systems at scale. But I realized uh, my entrepreneurial wiring um, started to become confined by this big cage of the big company and leapt out to the first dark side of, of startups and ended up doing three startups. The first one in analytics and kind of machine learning before it was cool and interesting. Um, the second really around innovation consulting and um, helping companies think through, you know, how to, how to really innovate um, around these constraints of business models and use things like scenario planning and blue ocean strategy. Um, and that was a lot of fun, but then I wanted to get back into the tech side and I ended up um, co-founding a company called Mobiquity that um, is now a couple thousand people, but really we were lucky enough to be at the leading edge of the mobile, I'll call it mobile revolution too, because the first mobile revolution was more about, you know, communications everywhere. The second mobile revolution was about how do you use the smartphone as an innovation platform? And obviously that was amped up when... Um, Apple really unleashed not only the iPhone, but iTunes and the whole platform of, you know, democratizing app development. Uh, so we got to ride that and build some really cool applications for people like Weight Watchers and Wawa and Panera and and really see um, this unleashing of not only capabilities on the consumer, but also um, companies being able to reinvent experiences. It also, much like the revolutions we're going through now, highlighted how technology is the easy part, actually. Companies changing underneath all that, their operating model, their business model. If they don't do that, they don't really unlock the full value of these technologies that started with mobile. I, I, I'd argue it's going to happen with AI the same. Then I spent two years in venture capital with Safeguard Scientifics, which a lot was a lot of fun being on the investment side um, and had this epiphany that, you know, sitting on the investment side, you see founders and I've been a founder, you've been a founder, spend, you know, their waking hours either trying to go acquire the assets that big companies already have, or like customer bases and brand equity and expertise, or, or raising money. And um when you think about that and that big companies already sit on capital and they already sit on all these resources, uh, me and a former colleague said, why can't big companies be the disruptors? Why can't they take all these advantages they're gifted with and apply them and run at the speed, um, you know, at of startups and, and basically be the ones to shape the market. And so we wrote Goliath's Revenge to really challenge the leaders of these established companies and say, you know, what are you doing with these assets that have limited shelf life? And how do you really transform yourself to be able to capture that? Because you, you have an unfair advantage. Uh, versus a startup. So why aren't you using it? And there's lots of reasons to get in the way. We know that. And then um, spent a lot of time consulting on that. And then eventually, um, for some crazy reason, decided to jump back in the front lines. So now I'm a chief digital officer at a company called Eversana, which is really cool life science commercialization company backed by private equity. Um, we really are transforming how life science products get brought to market. Everything from you know, patient access, marketing, selling, supporting patients, the supply chain. Uh, we've gotten the opportunity to rethink every um, stage of that relay race and and using technology and data to really transform it and hopefully get treatments to patients a lot faster, cheaper, better. Um, and I also, as you mentioned, have an alter ego where I spend time 
really teaching um, on these related topics, whether it's um, how to take this new emerging technology vector or change and how do you transform an organization? How do you think about innovation and creating new ventures? And I, I teach at Penn and the Wharton School around those type of topics and I'll also um, you know, advise other companies on it. Awesome. Well, that is, um, I mean, just quite a depth of experience. If we just hone in on maybe Goliath's Revenge um, for, for a minute, one of the things uh, that really struck out to me in the book, I mean, there's a lot of things there, um, but, but giving kind of a moniker to lowercase i and capital I innovation and companies kind of addressing this macro economic reality that new technology is coming faster than they oftentimes can adapt to change it. And companies understanding that there are different structures for lowercase i innovation and different structures for capital I. I just think it might just be worth for framing uh, for this conversation for maybe you to take a minute on kind of what, you know, how you see that and maybe how some of that plays out maybe at Eversana or other companies that, that you've had the benefit of working with. Yeah, you picked up Rule 2 and Goliath's Revenge, which is one of my favorites because I think it's the hardest dance that companies um, need to take on. And it's probably one of the ones they fail at the most, which is how do you ba balance this continual innovation around the current delivery model, operating model, business model that you know makes your current experiences and ways of doing business better. Um, and your employees are in the best position to see that opportunity every day because they're touching your customers or touching your operations. And yet most companies make it so hard for the average employee to bring an idea to fruition, to impact uh, for lots of reasons. They don't have the coaching and the support or they don't have the time or the seed funding, or there's no process in place to really judge and refine and improve an idea. Um, and so all those things get in the way and create friction to the point where employees just either don't bother um, or, you know, they take their ideas outside the company, uh, which is even worse. So that little I continual innovation is so important because A, your current business is one of your most important assets. The cash flows off of that. And if you don't keep it competitive and uh, and kind of running at the speed of the current market, then you're, you're going to miss the opportunity. Um, and it creates a culture of innovation where employees feel empowered to innovate every day around your current business. And that culture of innovation becomes really important when then you go and take on big eye, because if everybody's engaged in innovation, then they understand the importance of also taking some big swings that create the next version of your company. Uh, the next version of your business and operating model. And those big swings take more protection and air cover because by their nature, they're going to be different. They're going to drive tension with the current operating model and the current business model and the leaders that are running those businesses. So they need both protection, but they also need access to all the assets of and expertise of the company. Otherwise, you've thrown away your incumbent advantage. You know, you're just running the same race as a startup. So that's where a lot of companies have failed. Um, if you look at innovation labs over the last decade, the success rate is not very good, mostly because people felt like, okay, I can go plant a pirate flag in Silicon Valley, go hire a bunch of smart, you know, coders and data scientists, and they're going to come up with a brand new way of doing something in my company. That sounds great on paper until you try and bring those ideas back into the company and scale them, or that you try and navigate to attach them to some existing resources or data assets because um, nobody feels ownership of it. And it's not taking advantage of your platform and scale. So I think people have evolved. Big companies now have realized that yeah, we need this level of autonomy, but we also need connectivity and a sense of ownership um, and create that sense of ownership by making sure people in the current business are part of your investment council, but also that they recognize there are the need to go create these new ventures, the new micro businesses, whether it's through corporate venture capital, whether it's through internal incubators um, or other pathways, JVs. So you need to run both those speeds together in parallel. They need to coexist. There will be tension, but if you can manage that tension, that's what allows you to win today and play the current game better, but also change the game in the future.
Yeah. And, you know, I've seen this tension firsthand in a lot of places where, to your point, the innovation lab becomes this island of misfit toys and the line of business owners are saying, hey, we're actually building the systems that are making it paying for that thing. And we're not allowed to participate because some warehouse sometime is somehow the old thinkers. Um, and obviously different scales of business handle this differently. Um, are there any kind of mechanisms in that, you know, integration of, of how you get that involvement that allows innovation to get into the line of business um, in ways that, you know, don't require this kind of executive mandate? Or I guess the way I guess the question I'm trying to tie this to is, you know, part of it in my experience is how much throughput you're getting on these things. Like if you have an innovation lab and a structure, but it's doing one or two things a year versus your capacity to say new opportunities exist in the line of business, how quickly can we get things in there? Are there specific types of structures? Are you mentioned a couple there with investment council or other things? Um, it might just be worth sharing, you know what I mean? Like just some of the detailed yeah. mechanisms you've seen of how to get that interaction uh, honed. Yeah, I think I think there's three things I've seen have some level of success. One is, um, you know, I mentioned that investment council. I call it an internal venture board. Think of it like an internal VC that's looking at things with the same kind of ruthless prioritization as a VC would, but using internal dollars. And and that venture board has to be balanced in membership with people from the core business and people that are looking at the future business. And I would even argue the success factor I've seen is bring a few independent tiebreakers on that venture board, whether they're advisors to the firm, former venture capitalists, people that can look at things completely from a market neutral view uh, because and have credibility for, you know, on both sides of the fence, because ultimately you're going to get into some of those battles of how much do you want this incubator to service the core business and how much do you want it to service brand new white space? And you need people that can have a balanced, rational discussion around that and a balanced portfolio. The second is um, you need to find venture GMs. These are rare people. I call them also entrepreneurs that have that entrepreneurial attitude or willing to break glass, can inspire other people to follow them, uh, can run at the speed of digital and understand venture creation and lean startup and design thinking, but also have credibility back in the core business. You know, people would say, yeah, um, I respect John or Jill. Um, they've done things right in the company. They're, they exist in most big companies. We just have to find them because they sometimes get stuck in traditional legacy career paths. But they shine during our Little Eye Innovation tournaments. Those people are the ones you want to grab and say, you are now a venture GM and we're going to recycle you by helping us incubate those ventures to the level where they can become a micro business. So getting that pool of venture GMs that can run at both speeds, can reach back into the core business and also you know, guide these new venture teams. The third is populate those venture teams with not just brand new shiny digital talent, but a mix, and I've seen 50, 50 others of institutional legacy talent coupled with new digital thinkers. So T-shaped teams that can go very deep in an area like payments or you know, uh, EHR integration um, or health data and across can also have all the skills of product and business building and venture building that can, can make the best of both worlds. Uh, and once again, that's going to make sure you build something that can attach back to the core business platform or at least leverage it in the right way, even if you spin it out. So those three things I've seen really matter and sometimes companies get those wrong. Yeah, and I, I, I mean, again, I, I spent a lot of time last year talking to executives that are empowered to do these things, but there are not a lot of models out there for them to follow. You know, like I think, I think back to my early career, people would always talk. Oh, you mentioned being a GE, like Six Sigma GE, Lean Six Sigma, and Total Quality Management, and then with Lean Startup, right? There was a kind of a micro boom of that 15 years ago, and but that transition to the enterprise version of those things, especially as it relates to this, as opposed to just. Um, you know, this venture studio type concepts or just traditional M&A of buying startups and, you know, throwing the kind of startup DNA at the wall. Um, I'm surprised at that. 
You know, are, are there companies that, that you think are getting it right that are market leaders that people should be looking at right now? Yeah. And what's interesting, Pat, is like um, the models have to be yours. You know, yeah, you can start with copying or say, hey, that model looks like one that could work with us, but it has to work with your culture, who you are, your identity, your values. So, you know, I think of Walmart, um, who's gone through several iterations on their innovation model, um, but, you know, has kind of landed on the store eight model, which is pretty interesting where they've, as big as Walmart is, have become very adept at working with startups. So if they see a, a startup um, innovation that can help them, their ability to rapidly partner with that startup, define a pilot to get to a demonstration of value or impact. Um, and then really store eight is this concept. I can use any Walmart store, depending on what's most appropriate based on the customer audience or the way they operate. Pick one store to be able to demonstrate the value of that technology, whether it's you know using drones in the back office or some type of uh, data analytics play. And then once you demonstrate at one store, then go to 10 stores, then go to 100, then to 1,000, right? So that a very deliberate, you know, scaling model, go kill kind of model um, that's been pretty effective. Um, I think other um, approaches, you know, have been very skewed towards using corporate venture capital. Um, Intel was great at it for a long time, uh, you know, in the early days, Cisco as well as as a way to not only try before you buy, but also to place a lot of bets on different, you know, different trends so they could learn very fast um, because they could never do that with their internal incubator. Back to your point about capacity, you can only chase so many things. Um, and then I think like even... I, I think of um, old school financial service companies like Standard Charter, um, who, you know, has figured out a way to create, you know, use one of their regions, Hong Kong, to basically circulate um, talent from the core business, give them a tour of duty in the incubator, kind of gain these skills. Because, as you know, innovation is not something you read about in a textbook. It's a contact sport. You have to do it. You have to fail and get your hands dirty and then bring them back into the core business. And MasterCard does a little bit of this as well, I think really well. But but I think this idea of, you know, how do I create the talent pipeline um, of these entrepreneurs um, and, and some of them allow have an HR model that's flexible enough to allow people to do these tours of duty and maybe even stay with a venture. That's pretty, that creates a lot of tension in most corporate HR models today. So yeah, no, that's things. interesting because there were two examples that kind of came to mind um, as I was listening to you talk. The first is when I think about some franchise businesses that uh, they look at just some of the, the lower end markets as experiment areas, like you can try and you won't have reputational damage. You can try a lot of things, experiment on menus, experiment on digital experiences. Um, and then to your point, when I've seen companies that have multiple product brands, but they're selling more globally, then they would test something out in a smaller region market and then get the kinks worked out and migrate it. Yeah, sometimes um, you're, you're kind of small, I call it emerging markets that get ignored. It can be your best laboratories, right? Because yeah. Because they're under the radar, they, they're scrappy, they're resource constrained, which sometimes creates the opportunity for innovation, right? Yeah. yeah. And, you know, it's interesting because I travel a lot, you know, I'm sure you do as well with my work. But when I go to emerging markets, there's also that kind of leapfrog effect where everyone's just on a <laughs> phone. You're not transitioning from legacy technology. And there's actually a lot of business cases that are forward. You know, then think about Internet hospitals in China. I mean, like Ooh. when you have wait times that are years to, to go see a doctor, get a procedure like that creates innovation opportunities. Right. Yeah. So. Well, I do want to bring AI into the conversation. But before we do, I want to touch on uh, uh, the academic side of the universe. So one of the other themes I really like from Goliath's Revenge is this idea of you have to build an ecosystem. And, you know, I spend a certain amount of time um, after doing an, an executive MBA feeling like. It was taught at the height of the end of the manufacturing era as all the digital lean startup product stuff was coming in. And I thought to myself, they probably won't be teaching this in business school for 10 years, right? But now you can learn it for free in meetups. And so some of these models where I see companies building, as you said, these tours of duty, that could replace an executive MBA. 
On the other flip side, I've seen enterprises that have spent tens of millions of dollars with big consulting companies saying, I'd rather do R1 research university co-projects. I'd rather be the test bed integrated into some PhD data science student sponsor scholarships than pay $1,000 an hour for these people as consultants. But there is something interesting, I just think because the, these new tech is coming faster, that that integration of a foot in the startup ecosystem, understanding what the research universities are doing, um, but also just integrating curriculum, less than a two-year MBA program. It's more like I might, do, as a business leader, just in time, need someone to understand how to do a funding or a business case so that they can then do a project. They don't need the whole degree. Since you sit at this interesting intersection, like, you know, how do you see that ecosystem play evolving? Because to me, it's there's like so much raw material and potential there, but it's so hard to bring these universes together. Yeah, I, I think it's actually um, the companies that do this well. And and in many ways, the same transformation we've been talking about around digital is no different than what we're going to see for AI, like the same muscles of using data as currency, building, you know, leveraging the power of innovation networks. They're just going to become more important because you're going to be even less capable of doing the things you need to do internally. And you're going to have to figure out how do I leverage the assets I have like data to attract innovators to want to work with me or attach to my platform? And I think, um, you know, when you think about uh, what's going on now um, and the reason companies like Microsoft have been so successful, they have partnering in their DNA. Like they, they've kind of built their success on ecosystems with VARs and now with the gaming development and a community and, and stuff like that. So it was natural for them to like extend that muscle to, you know, AI and other things. And I think the idea that, um, you know, there's a two-way benefit for partners. A lot of companies just aren't very good at partnering. It's not part of their DNA, but I think it goes back to how easy is it for a researcher, an innovator to attach to your platform? Um, and I think, you know, if you can think about that from the other side, a lot of people think about, yeah, let me go just you know, scout and I'll, I'll maybe seed fund one of these, these innovators. But if you really think about how easy are you for an innovator or a startup to go partner with, um, does it take six months to get a contract in place to do a pilot? Um, is it impossible to unlock data in an anonymized way, you know, on Kaggle or any other marketplace to go build a new model? Um, do you have somebody like a venture GM that's not just assigned to internal innovations, but to bring these external innovations into and productize them within, you know, Goliath? Because if you don't have those, it's going to stumble. If you don't have a legal team and a compliance and cyber team that's thinking about how do I make it easy, um, but also protect the risk of the company for these new innovators to innovate on our platform. Um, that if you can do that, um, you've, un, you know, you've unlocked and multiplied your R&D department by a hundred and like a lot of companies don't think that way because they're just so used to control, like command and control environments and, you know, owning the IP and owning the data and everything's going to be ex an exchange in the future. Nobody's going to own all the assets required to solve some of the big problems. So if you can't build ecosystems, you're, you may be out of the game in some mm -hmm. cases. So, all right. So let's, that's interesting. Let's shift over to, um, to, to AI. So, you know, I, um, I'm just curious kind of how you, you know, in your experience, right, this has come over the horizon. I think that it's somewhat interesting. We're talking about the smartphone, how in the wake of the financial crash of 2008 and nine rose the smartphone economy, right? The phone being launched in 07. And here we are again in a well-placed financial <laughs> constriction and AI kind of rises out of this as this kind of next big thing. Um, you know, how, how are you guys looking at it? How are you leveraging the strengths or the, the programs that you already had in place? Can you talk a little bit about what you've been kind of looking at and what you guys have been doing over the last six to 12 months? Um, or when did you're maybe asking in another way, you know, when did this get on the radar for you guys? How did you kind of intake it relative to what you were already doing with product and, and innovation programs? Yeah, and I love the fact you kind of highlighted the analog of the mobile um, 
the mobile revolution because I think it's very similar. I mean, in fact, I call Gen AI, Gen AI an iPhone moment. You know, while yeah. classical AI, predictive AI has been around for decades and we've been using it in our company, other companies have been using it for a long time. I think generative AI obviously has kind of opened it up to the masses to be able to task AI directly versus through data science teams and, you know, kind of centralized groups. But it's, uh, we were fortunate that we had leaders in our company, uh, and I was part of that as well, that just sounded the alarm that said, this is, this is not just an evolution of old AI. This is going to change everything. And I think this is the, it, it kind of portrayed the challenge um, because, you know, the initial instinct for a lot of companies is, you know, let's run a lot of experiments. Let's see where it can drive value. Let's maybe buy co-pilot for a lot of our employees. Let's give people training. And that's cool because I think there's a certain level of literacy and understanding of what Gen AI is good and good for and not so good for. But I think where I think the bigger opportunity and maybe the scarier opportunity is, is to go future back and say, um, let's start clean sheet of paper and rethink our entire operating model and delivery model in a world that's, you know, kind of fully leveraging generative AI. What does that look like? So for instance, um, at Eversana, we own a full service agency. Agencies do things like create content, review content, disseminate content, right, for brands. Um, there are a lot of hours spent in that content supply chain that have a huge opportunity. Um, and fortunately, we have a chief innovation officer who also formerly ran the agency and created it for Cape N that basically has said, um, we are not going to be the disrupted. We're going to be the disruptor. And so we went early in on how can we take that entire content supply chain and think, you know, AI first. And so partnership with Adobe on Firefly for content creation, creating our own MedRig review tool with Amazon and, and using Anthropic, um, and then using AI as part of that dissemin smart dissemination with our orchestrate engine um, and using Gen AI to, to build audiences faster. So we've basically said, we're not going to sit back on our hands. We're not just going to think incrementally. We want step changes. We want three to five X kind of improvements. Um, starting to do that in the other parts of the business, but that part of the business was ready to move. So we're like, why wait? And I think that's what we're going to see in a lot of companies. You're going to see certain BUs, certain functions that, whether it's through leadership, vision, or whether it's just the maybe the pressure from the marketplace to say that part is going to get you know disrupted faster. I think that's what you'll see in companies. Um, but I think a lot of companies they're kind of unleashing the grassroots stuff, maybe putting guardrails in place, probably not fast enough. Um, but they're not necessarily doing the thinking future back on their operating model because that is that is truly uh, where the disruption is going to happen. Having said all that, and I am a technologist at, at heart like you, but I, I do think Gen AI is going to go through fits and starts, you know, like like a lot of these other revolutions. And it's going to hit snags. You know, I talk about the three R's a lot responsibility, which is your guardrails and guidelines, reliability, which is, are we picking use cases that are suited to AI in its ability to perform at a certain reliability level today with a certain error rate? Um, there's plenty of use cases where we can have that. There are sidekicks, where humans in loop, but you know, are we going to unleash it to a patient to give them clinical advice tomorrow? Probably not now, maybe in three years, maybe in two years, who knows? Then I think the last one is ROI. And this is where I think everybody's scratching their head because I don't think anybody really has a good sense of what the ROI of these tools is all in, mostly because people aren't treating them like products. Um, they're standing them up, they're piloting them, they're getting exciting results. But then when they start to think about the life cycle of, you know, kind of optimizing this over time and model drift and, you know, having teams that govern these things and support them and can support customers using them, like as well as the infrastructure costs, the API costs, all those things. I think getting a grip on the ROI of these will be one of the biggest challenges as the data starts to come in. 
I'm super optimistic about where this could end up, but I think we're going to go through some, you know, some yeah. hard learnings along the way. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And, and, it, and it kind of feels like things that, that we're seeing early on is that, you know, you see the shiny thing in the goalpost, and then you realize that you're on the wrong side of the Grand Canyon with the things you've been ignoring for the last five years that have to feed. Right, that, that have to get cleaned up. up. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I, I also, I, I think what's interesting, um, you know, having the benefit of uh, growing up through the internet economy, and when I was coming out of college in the early 90s, you know, installing Windows 3.1 on disks. And I've, I've, I always do this exercise every now and then to say, man, if I took my college tuition from my first couple of years of school and just bought Microsoft stock as opposed to get educated, you know. But there's a couple things when, the, when you talk about the iPhone moment. So when the iPhone moment happened, I looked at it and I thought, I've been, I've kind of seen this before with the computer, right? You got your first computer had no internet. Right. Then you get dial up at work and no Internet at home. Then you get broadband at work and dial up at home. And and so I was looking at the phone and I was thinking, OK, there's an inflection point kind of moment that maybe we can forecast. And I was thinking about three things. I was thinking about Moore's law with like at what point is hardware commodified enough where every consumer can afford this or have it subsidized in a plan. Then I was and I would love to I've been asking all the kind of math PhDs around MODIS, is there a equivalent of Moore's law for network bandwidth? I don't know, I would love to know, like if you know any metric there, but the idea that once you get unlimited data plans, then people are the usage and over the wire type things. And then the third component was more a function of developer productivity. And that's why I was thinking about open source. So I thought there'll be a market making inflection point for mobile. When you have Moore's law do its thing at a certain price point, that equivalent matched with bandwidth, so it's unlimited, that people can use the device, and then we can make apps in months, not years. And that was more a function of not needing massive teams at low cost offshore, but smart teams, kind of startup type teams with the right tools, or they are writing the last mile of code, not the whole code. And so when I take that thinking to this moment we are today, looking out to 2030 and saying, well, there's like, there was already some market making physics around, you know, if you go beyond the phone as a sensor to just any IoT, B2B, B2C, and then you have 5G, whatever Elon Musk and, and uh, Bezos are fighting over, over satellite 5, an always on, always connected universe, then the next productivity quotient might not be the next generation of open source. It might be this AI powered developer, right? Or whatever this kind of moment's gonna be. And, I guess within that, right, opens up all new kind of conversations just around um, the kind of applications that can build to your point about things around ethics, right? Well, will developers, you know, or, or anyone that can use these tools, are there going to have to be certificate, you know, are we going to get into certifying the people that can use the tools? I'm just curious, and you know, if you have any comments on like, how do we define an inflection moment for AI, to your point, we're still in this very investigative promise but not utility per se like that everyone can just turn on tomorrow um but it also comes with new concerns right about what should it be allowed to do and i'm curious what you know where's your thinking you know in that universe yeah i think um i think that's back to um first of all you know hygiene is have you spent the time in your company thinking about what your responsible development guidelines are and how you're going to govern that um, because if you haven't you better do that because letting a flower thousand flowers bloom and doing self-service innovation with AI, like if you don't have your employees understanding like where are we willing to go and not go as a company then you're going to get yourself into trouble and you're going to you know incur risk and you can obviously use partners to help you manage some of that risk, whether it's your cloud providers, whatever. But I think you first have to start there for, and and that's unique to your values, your company. It's not like go take whoever's, you know, um, like Mayo Clinic's uh, uh, guidelines. Maybe they're a good place to start, but you need your own. Um, I think, I think the second thing is um, it kind of goes back to the operating model thing a little bit, but looking for those use cases where um, you, you have tons of hours at stake. And I think if you're a, a, you do a lot of in-house development, um, then you better be looking at the tools that can not only help with code development, but code review, 
um, and really and replication. Um, and I think I think those are obvious targets, but not not every company does a lot of in-house development. So you got to first ask yourself, like, is that a target worth going after? And how do we go after it? I think the bigger ones are like, you know, for the little I innovation stuff, I think it's going to be the opportunity once people start playing with Copilot is, um, you know, both content creation review, but I think the other one is what I call conversational analytics. The ability for people to interact directly with data, which kind of the old BI interface, uh, data cube, like how do I basically just ask questions of the data? Like, why is my product sales lagging in Boston by 10%? Give me the top three reasons. And, you know, the ability to do that, to go to the next layer of understanding of the data with very low friction, I think will help people across the entire enterprise uh, that today have had to go through several steps to get that kind of analysis or query. And um, I think that's going to cause some interesting disruptions there. I think the other thing that companies need to think about is the experience layer is going to change. There is going to be a day where people will not go to web properties the same way anymore. Um, you may not go to Shopify. You may not go to WebMD. Um, you may not go to Expedia the same way you did before. You're just going to deal with your agent or co-pilot and it's going to navigate to the actions you need to take. And how does that change if your goal is to deliver experiences or meet people where they are? How's that all going to change? Um, both internally, and externally, that that's going to be dramatic, I think. Yeah, so. you know, I, I th this is interesting because I still think of myself as a pretty kind of with it, you know, like young guy at fifty, and then I talk to my nineteen and twenty-two year old who I never could get to learn how to code. And my son said to me at one point, Dad, why would I ever learn how to code when I can just click on Shopify? I, I need to know how to market and identify my customers, market to them, and understand how to leverage these channels. All the tools are democratized. And so, you know, when, when we think about it from our relative frame of reference, almost knowing too much and seeing the early, like I think from the 90s to 2000, 2000 to 10, like these are just like the first few minutes of the universe as it relates to the software digital economy. And some of their use cases are, are thinking, we're born in a universe where we didn't have to build the tools. And the closest analogy I can get to that is like, when I talk to old head engineers, they say they were shocked that guys like me never learned how to write an operating system or something. I'm yeah. like, why would I do that? Why would I <laughs> right. do that? You couldn't write a kernel, yeah. Exactly. So hopefully there's a little bit of like, you know, the kids will be okay. The, the other analogy that I think informs, you know, to your point, this kind of democratization of digital tooling is, you know, my whole career, people have told me in three years, I'll be out of a job because, you know, the next version of Adobe will write websites for you or what have you. And they were saying that in the 90s, right? And I remember a few years ago when low code was kind of all the rage, talking to all my friends that were CTOs or, or similar or chief architects, whatever, in low code companies. And I would just ask them one question, like, who's your work? If your stuff is so great and guys like me are so passe, Who's your worst customer? And without fail, they would all reference like these big banks and other kind of entities. And I would say, why? And they're like, well, they don't know how to write requirements. You know, they don't know what they want. So no matter how much you democratize the writing of code to zero, if you don't know what you want and you don't know how to articulate the business rules around it, guess what? It doesn't matter if the code gets generated, right? And so I, I do feel like to your point, that if we're democratizing a set of tools that really took years to master in the prior era, well, the logical thinking, the structuring of architecture, right, there's a difference between building a doghouse and building a skyscraper, right? And I feel like some of those analogies as it relates to all the pieces that you have to integrate to get the data pipelines to feed your custom models, there's a lot of discipline around that, whether or not you're hand coding it or leveraging AI tools. You yeah, know? no, I think there's so many things that need to be thought about. So I, I think we're going to get into it, whether it's security audits, all those things like, you know, it's great to have AI generate the code, but like, are we, is it building it in a way that's going to allow us to do the things we still need to do to protect the enterprise? So, yeah. And I, I think to your point about, I think conversational analytics is a very interesting thing to just kind of put a pin in because you know, ERPs, I'm still amazed how bad the user interfaces are. You would think the design thinking and just basic UI 
design patterns from the last 10 years would have been brought into ERPs and they haven't, but maybe now that's not really a problem they're going to have to solve. It's the same when I talk to, to banking clients still on COBOL and mainframes. I'm like, okay, now for now they really think they might have a strategy with AI code analysis and pattern design to take parts of these monoliths and move them and migrate them to more modern code bases using these tools, but not to your point, like the tools aren't going to do all the work for you. Yeah. I mean, it's going to be interesting. Companies are going to have to think about, I don't think it's that different than digital, except now owning the application might only be part of it. So there's going to be barbells, right? Like the people that own the content and the data, and the data that's unique to train these models, which is why Reddit seems to still maintain some value, right? Um, uh, not only as an outlet, but it's got some really interesting, diverse data to go train uh, Gen AI. Um, but the other side of the barbell is how are you going to embed AI in an experience that people still care about? So that's why Adobe, I give them kudos. You know, they built Firefly right into the creative platform that creatives already love and basically allowed them to supercharge what they're already doing versus, you know, maybe there's some enterprise platforms that we don't all love that will get unbundled in the era of, of Gen AI, right? Um, and so the question is like the model itself and the infrastructure, like we know what's going to happen with those, but you know, where do you want to be as an enterprise? Um, you want to, you want to figure out how your experience is going to change and how do you build this into those? And then how do you start to amass data and content that you can create vertical, like we're in healthcare, how do we create vertical applications, whether it's in patient support or field sales that are going to uniquely use that data to deliver expertise to the edge of your business. Um, and that's exciting. Yeah. So I think, you know, going back to one of your previous topics here, and as we kind of wind down here, Scott, so, you know, when I, when I think about any new thing, you always hear like, oh, there's the director of internet or the director of mobile, right? Or the director of cloud and these kind of leading indicator titles that, okay, in some point in three years, that's just going to be absorbed into product development or product management or what have you. Um, but, but these folks being put in roles that have a high degree of uncertainty, right? We're trying to create a structured position and a structured department within a broader enterprise that can actually function, scale, integrate, um, but handle high degrees of uncertainty all along the way. So if you come across folks that are just getting put into these jobs, hey, guess what? You're now our director of AI, or we're taking you out of the corporate innovation team and you're gonna have to run this thing or integrate it into the corporate innovation team. And you think about that first 30, 60, 90 days that they're in that. What, as we end our time, you're like, what, what kind of advice do you find yourself or conversations that you're getting into people's concerns? What, how do you think people can set themselves up for success if they're the one who's going to have to take on this mantle and, you know, start bringing some of this thinking into the enterprise? Yeah, I think you need somebody who's kind of an AI champion within every function, including like HR, finance, procurement, and BU that feels some level of ownership and you know can coordinate the activities of that part of the business back with the governance model make sure like there's ruthless prioritization of the portfolio you're giving people the tools to go learn and create but you're also picking where you're going to invest you know because otherwise this is going to be sprawl all over again and you know we're going to end up with a bunch of like half built products and gen ai things that have to be maintained so i think that's one i think the second is the bold businesses are going to create sidecar uh, shadow versions of their existing operations. And they're going to build them with clean sheets of paper. And I've been talking to some companies in the media space that are saying like, okay, the only way to do this back to the big eye innovation is we probably need to build this in parallel alongside our existing operation because it's just too much of a change from a change management standpoint. But we need some experts from the core business to help us. But then really, once we can prove that out on maybe it's a region or part of our business, like then like eventually migrate to it. But that model, whether it's, you know, the marketing side, whether it's, you know, your supply chain, like how are you truly going to drive a step change? I almost think you're going to see these like sidecar versions of your operations that have to be proven out to say, I can do this very differently with you know, whether it's the labor model, whether it's just the speed or whatever it is. So I think I think we're going to see some of that because most incubators have been directed at revenue producing things. I think a lot of this is going to be about internal operations that then allow me to, 
you know, redirect my resources to new innovations.